I'm going to talk a little bit about the work that uh, we're doing now and I, what I'm focusing on in terms of global advanced technology policy with, uh, I'm spending about, uh, oh, probably 70% of my time in emerging countries uh, globally, right? Latin America, Middle East, Africa, um, Asia, Southeast Asia, um, Central Eastern Europe. Um, in other words, I'm also spending time in Europe and the U.S., but uh, the issues on ICT and development uh, in Europe, in the U.S., and Canada, North America, uh, in Europe are pretty well settled. I mean, there are a lot of issues, right? But it's not transformative, as potentially transformative as it is in emerging countries. So we've been doing a lot of work about looking at the relationship between uh, ICT, investment, uh, applications, use, GDP, GDP growth, productivity, and what it means for a country. And there are a lot of questions that are still unanswered. So that's, at the end we'll have to talk about researchable questions because we, and I don't mean Cisco, I mean we in the community need the help of, of really good academic research to help answer the, some of these really important questions, close the gap so that we have much better understanding of what's needed going forward. Um, so I'll talk about a little bit about the, the importance of broadband and ICT, as much as we know. Uh, talk about a project that we're doing, which is, in my mind, fascinating. And it's a real uh, discussion, conversation opener with ministers and regulators globally. Um, some of the policies for digital inclusion and country transformations and then questions for research. So one of the things that we do know, you know, when, when Bill and I started in this, and you would talk about ICT, you know, with, with uh, public officials, ministers, politicians, they had no idea what you were talking about. Um, uh, in fact, I was at, at NSF, put together a workshop asking the question, right, and we funded some research, what is the relationship between telecoms and development, tele, tele density and development, and working with people at the World Bank, Bjorn Wilenius, and so on. And um, we had people come to this meeting saying there's no relationship and people need uh, clean water, not telephones, right? And that also drove a lot of the thinking uh, about why mobile would never be a product for the emerging countries, right? Mm -hmm wrong, right, completely different models. Well, what's happened now is that there is uh, a consensus that is built, whether it's at the UN, World Bank, IMF, in the developing world, that there is a very important link uh, between ICT and economic growth, right, for social as well as economic goals, and I'll talk more about goals later. Um, so it's social inclusion, productivity gains, uh, and government, good government and, and the delivery of government services. One of the things that, uh, you know, and this is not just related to ICT, but, you know, you can, but the impact of pro that productivity has on uh, the standard of live in, living uh, and the, the well-being of, of, of citizens. You know, if, if you, Productivity gains of 1% let you double the standard of living in 72 years, right? More than a lifetime uh, in most of the countries we're talking about. If you can, you know, get your productivity gains to 3%, you can double the standard of living in 24 years, and then there's this almost unattainable 5% productivity gain that lets you double the standard of living um, in, in 14 years. Now, this is, I'm going to come back to this at the, at, the, at the end because this is one of the areas where we need a lot more research. <clears throat> there is, we know that there is a correlation, a very high correlation based upon uh, U.S. and European statistics um, between ICT or IT uh, investment as a percent of CapEx increase. In other words, what percentage of the capital expenditure and economy is dedicated to the IT sector, right? That is highly correlated with productivity gains. Now, what we don't know and what we can't say is anything about causality. Do you have more IT investment because you have more productive economy? Uh, or does the investment in IT increase your, your national productivity? 
right? And there is now, for a long time, there was the, you know, productivity, you know, there's, the, uh, you know, yeah, was it, um, uh, yeah, those guys who are basically saying, well, you know, we see computers everywhere except in the productivity numbers, right? 1975 or 78, they said that. No longer true. We actually see that now. So in, at least intuitively, we do, under, we do believe that there is, is causality, but it's never been clearly shown. Uh, second, um, we do know that productivity tracks IT investment, right? But it also GDP growth tracks productivity gains. So, you know, if, you know, one plus two plus three, A plus B plus C, you would think that there is a, and there is a correlational relationship between investment in IT, productivity, and GDP growth. What that relationship is as you begin to unpack it is not clear. And having a better understanding of that relationship and how it actually interacts with, with emerging economies is extremely important. We used to think about three essential infrastructures, energy, water, and transportation. And I think it's clear now that there is a fourth essential infrastructure, which is connectivity. Right? And it's, it's not tele telephones, it's not telephony. It really is IP networks, it's broadband. Um, because if you get the broadband everywhere, then you can do voice on top of it, you can do all kinds of things, interactions, education, healthcare improvements. We have a lot of examples of that globally. Um, and this has been the breakthrough of the last three or four or five years. Right? When I would talk at the World Bank 10 years ago or 20 years ago, uh, when I was at Annenberg and doing things like this, it was all about energy, water, transportation. Roads, generators, power, and communications wasn't even on there. But we now know, I mean, they're all of the examples of, you know, the, the farmers in, and the, you know, the fishermen in, um, uh, in you know, Africa, the, 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 the farmers in, you know, Bangladesh, uh, people being able, because of communications, getting better prices, uh, working better in terms of aligning markets, supply and demand, and so on. So one of the things that we've done, um, and I'm going through this very quickly because I want more sort of discussion, um, is using World Economic Forum data, ITU data, and others, we created a, a, a mapping of the ICT ecosystem. Um, for the ecosystem, we took a look at things like ICT policy and regulation, laws relating to ICT, burden of government regulation, uh, market competition, general business climate. How many days does this take to start a business? You know, in some of the countries uh, I work in, it can literally, to get a permit to open a small shop, can take six months. You know, in other countries, you know, you walk into the, you know, local town hall, it's stamped and you walk out in 15 minutes, right? Huge difference. Um, levels of corruption, efficiency of the legal framework, um, capacity for innovation under the market competition, intensity of local competition. So those are the sort of things in the ecosystem. We then took a look at <coughs> infrastructure. And it's both hard infrastructure and soft infrastructure. So on the infrastructure side, it includes skills for ICT, right? Availability of, uh, you know, engineers and scientists, specialized training quality of math uh, uh, and science education, uh, domestic networks, then we have the hard infrastructure, right? the things that you think about, mobiles, you know, fiber, mobile penetration, international bandwidth access. In Africa, that's a huge problem. Right? There's one cable on the west coast of Af Africa that connects uh, the African countries to the internet. If you are in West Africa and want to send an email to East Africa, it is routed through Europe, through whatever the original colonial power was. So if you are in a uh, former French colony in West Africa and want to send an email to somebody in Kenya, right, it would go from uh, Cameroon to Paris to London to Kenya. Right? There, are no, there are very, very few internet exchange points in Africa. There's insufficient bandwidth. The prices are off the charts, right? There are people now actually working on investing and bringing more fiber cables, but that is really crucial. We don't even think about that here. 
right? We take for granted big fat fiber pipes going across the Atlantic, going across the Mediterranean, linking the world. There are parts of the world that don't have that, so that's actually quite important. We then developed metrics for each of these using, it wasn't us, but you know, a, a model based upon the data from all these various sources, ITU, um, World Bank, and uh, World Economic Forum, and then began to map them. Um, from, you know, on the uh, quality of the ecosystem from best to poor, and then on the infrastructure. And what, what you would predict, right, actually, right, turns out to be correct, uh, which is if you have a poor ecosystem, you, you really don't have the kind of infrastructure. And what you see is that as, as you move up and improve your, infra your, your ICT ecosystem, you actually improve the infrastructure investment. Um, and everybody wants to know where you are, right? I mean, this, and this, is, this is, right? So, and I'll, I'll, I'll look at specific, you know, countries. But uh, if you, you take a look at uh, the UK, um, you know, it's up here. Uh, the US is over here. Um, and this is, again, this is not the OECD, you know, you know broadband numbers, right? And it's, it's a much more complex uh, set, of, set of variables. Um, so, what you would, what you would, yeah. So, where are you from? Taiwan. Oh, okay. You know, yeah. You know, but you're doing okay, right? But the question is, so this is the question. It, I don't care. I've, I've presented this, right, in, um, in Singapore, right? And they're way up here, right? Right? And they want to know, okay, so why, why does Hong, you know, I have a better, I have a better eco, why does Hong Kong have, have more investment, right? It, I don't, and, and if you're Korea, they want to know, all right, I have to, or Hong Kong, I'm looking over my shoulder. Okay. What's interesting are the um, uh, sort of northern European countries. Okay. And you take a look at, you know, I would argue that a lot of, of the, the ecosystem and investment has been a result of uh, what the, uh, uh, what's happened with you know, the European Union, the Commission, some of the competition directives, the things that have come out of the 90s. Um, that's really created this ecosystem that's led to the investment infrastructure. Now, what are some of the other implications of this? Again, intuitively you would predict this, and it turns out it's correct based on the data. If you're in the lower left, you have very high connectivity costs and low, low bandwidth, low uh, broadband penetration. Right? In the upper right, you have lower prices and higher penetration. Uh, now, if you take a look at some of the regions in the world, in Central and South America, right, most of the countries are down here. Um, we're working uh, with the government of Chile on a national digital strategy. And Chile comes out pretty well here. Um, what's interesting is in meeting with the uh, Minister of Economy and the officials in Chile, they said, well, this is, this is great, but we don't want to be compared with our regional peers. We want to be compared with our aspirational peers, right? And they're up here. So it's a very interesting conversation. And then it opens up the conversation of, okay, what do I need to do to improve? What do I need to do to move up here and move over here? And for Chile, which is pretty good on the ecosystem, their investment isn't as good as it otherwise would be if you're on the, on the straight curve. They should be over here someplace. So that actually opens up other questions having to do with, um, in Chile in particular, um, education a wide divide uh, in terms of uh, 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 income. Um, uh, part of it is geography, a very long and thin country. Um, so they actually say, well, New Zealand is thin and long. You know, where's New Zealand, right? Uh, and actually, New Zealand does, does quite well. Um, Africa, way down at the bottom, right? Uh, you know, you're all following what's happening in Zimbabwe, right? It is not surprising where they are on ICT development. They're there for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, part of this also, even though South Africa is up here, it should be here, lack of bandwidth. That's reasonably priced. Bandwidth costs, again, it's a killer. There's no competition um, in uh, bandwidth, international bandwidth. And this is something that they're very concerned about. Central and Eastern Europe, uh, with the exception of Estonia, the home of Skype, right? You know, um, still developing. 
Now, the, obviously, the, the, the you know, sort of central um, uh, European countries are here. Eastern European countries are here. Uh, the leftover from uh, the old uh, Soviet regime in terms of uh, having to, you know, not have the, the kind of ecosystem yet, and they're moving in. These are the countries that have, that have uh, you know, been admitted to the Union. You know, these have not. Right, uh, and here you also have what they people euphemistically refer to as post-conflict societies. The Gulf, the Middle East, they have a lot of money, right, and they have a lot of fiber, but they don't have the same kind of open markets, ease to do business, and other aspects of the ecosystem. And um, so they actually, you would have predict, you would have thought, well, gee, maybe they would be doing better because they have money. They actually have fiber. They have, you know, business connection. They, you know, have a lot of, you know, international banking. But it hasn't really filtered out to the rest of the economy, to citizens, and to small, medium enterprise. So what are some policies that can actually improve this, and how, do, how can we begin thinking about this? So I tend to think as a former, and actually, Bill, it was, um, uh, I was at Commerce for a couple of years, bef even before. I mean, I was still at the University of Iowa on leave, right? Uh -huh. And I was, at, I was doing domestic policy at the, at something called NTIA, which was at Commerce when I was working with uh, the Annenberg folks. And I said, well, do you want to come over? And I said, yeah, that'd be fun. Um, and then I was at the FCC for about 19 years and ran the policy shop there for, uh, for 15. And so when I woke up every morning, uh, and talk to, and sort of think about it from a, uh, the, the, the perspective of, uh, you know, sort of a senior civil servant or uh, the people I worked for who were, um, uh, you know, FCC chairman um, and people who are, you know, political appointees. Um, right, Jacob? Uh, you know, public officials tend to think in, in sort of in somewhat oversimplified ways every day. And if you're, a, if you're an elected official, you wake up and you say, okay, so what do I need to do to be reelected? That's quite simple. Richard is a <laughs> former elected official, a member of parliament here in, here in Britain, right? right? Every morning, right? You wake up, what do I need to do to be reelected? Like and down the rescue package. That's right, the rescue package. There you go, right? Um, and, if you, and, and if you, and by the way, if, if you are in a, in a non democratic country, right, it's what do I need to do not to be overthrown, um, right? I like my job. And so actually, it, People tend to think in, 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 in terms of two, two baskets of goals, right? Some economic and some social, and they're both important, right? It's the, you know, jobs, job security, right? We're seeing that now with the global markets and what's happening uh, on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, and right now in the middle of the presidential campaign in the states, you know, this rescue package and the politics surrounding that. Um, it's about the, the economy. Uh, it's productivity, innovation, investment, Right? Capital markets lock up, people get upset, They've, they're afraid of losing their bank accounts. So there's a whole economic basket of, of issues that people are concerned about. At the same time, there are social issues that are just as important. Social inclusion, um, pluralism, diversity, culture, social cohesion, public safety, citizenship. And what's interesting is in many of the countries uh, around the world, most, right, you have Diverse, of, diverse cultures, there are very few countries with homogeneous populations, ethnically and culturally. There are few, right? Japan, for example. But most countries are um, uh, ethnically uh, and culturally uh, quite diverse. And at the same time, so they want to balance diversity, but also notions of social cohesion and inclusion. Right? And if these are the goals for public policy, if you think about it, communications, people talking to each other or the kinds of things I was talking about before, which are the economic benefits of ICT investment, ICT investment communications can help achieve both sets of these goals. Right? And so it's becoming increasingly, communications is becoming increasingly important at the core of sort of political activity, but it's not thought of that way. It's sort of a, a, a you know, sort of the platform on which everything else um, gets built. 
So <clears throat> it's really important, and, and one of the big issues, whether it's Britain, US, Mexico, Chile, Vietnam, um, is you know, how do I have digital inclusion? Right? I'm an optimist. People talk about the digital divide. I think it's a, that's a glass half empty, right? So I want to. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Um, so I actually like to think of digital inclusion, right? So the question is, you know, not wringing hands over the people who aren't there. It's rather policies to figure out how to get them connected and on board. So, and I think that, and so that's an issue, right? So if if in fact, you know, I'm half right about these, then. For citizenship and economic benefits, everybody has to have access. And the question is, how do you get that? Now, you know, in most, so this is, you know, the, your, your basic diffusion curve, right? Your, your S curve. And if I'm talking about um, microwave ovens, right, that's fine. Um, you know, maybe half the population gets a microwave oven. There's no great economic social loss no need for government to intervene, who cares? Right, that, and that's fine. Um, but if it's something that government thinks is important enough, um, you know, that it really needs to be uh, something that actually needs to, you need to move this up because you want everybody connected. You know, we've in the past talked about universal service obligations, USO for telephones. Um, and that's sort of doing that for telephones. I and mean, you, you can debate whether it was done efficiently or, or effectively and all the problems with the way it's done. The question is, what's the role for government? So if you think about it, government has, in my mind, several <clears throat> very legitimate roles. First, government has had a traditional role as a catalyst, pre-commercial research and development, right? Funding, you know, universities. In the US, it's the National Science Foundation. Here, you have um, the, research councils. the research councils and you, you know, work with, with them back in, in your previous life, right? So um, uh, market stimulation, market acceleration, right? So this is early um, uh, in government work as a catalyst. But then I think there's another point, which is sort of, it's closing the gap, right? So it's both on supply and demand. If I want to take and bring the curve up, right, there are things that government can do that can affect uh, supply on digital inclusion, All right? So this is extending the reach. So in, in rural areas that are very low density, the market is not going to invest to bring broadband to very rural areas because it's just not economic. The question is what policies can government bring to bear that are the least market distorting that can create the opportunities to acceler either accelerate deployment to unserved areas or to uh, get deployment where it, it means it's not even accelerating, it's just getting it there. So th there's some things that can be done. There are a lot of different tools. Um, one is access to rights away, uh, making public ducts available, putting ducts in whenever you build a road. You know, I'm working in, in Lebanon, uh, with, we have an uh, engagement in Lebanon uh, for a national broadband strategy uh, working with government and talk about post-conflict societies, right? Though that's not yet post, unfortunately. Um, and one of the things that everybody on all the sides agreed to immediately, and the president is going to issue a decree, is to have um, all new road, con and there's been a lot of road construction, reconstruction, put in ducts, empty duct work. And then anybody can put in their own fiber. All right? that, can that can reduce the cost of fiber construction by 60 to 80%. It's civil engineering. It's not electronics or anything fancy. Um, and then there's the supply side. I'm sorry, the, I'm sorry, the demand. It's the applications. Um, it's getting rid of foolish regulation. Right? If you regulate voice over IP, that decreases demand. What you want to do is, is enable and foster and encourage applications that are compelling to create the value proposition that people, once they have it, they subscribe. And there's another piece of this demand side, which is if you think about it today, eventually it'll, it'll go to your mobile. But today, 
If you don't have a computer, there's no point in connecting to the internet. Um, and forget connecting to broadband. So there are a lot of countries that have very low PC penetration. And the question is, are there policies that can help improve PC penetration? And there are. In fact, if you take a look at Korea's um, uh, broadband penetration, it is higher, as, as high as it is, in part, not because of policies related to internet, or internet subsidy or broadband or any of that, because they really didn't. A lot of that was really market driven. There was a program uh, developed through the post office for low-income families that had children, students, and if they didn't have a PC, you could rent one. You could lease it from the post office for a few dollars a month. Right? And the first thing that people did when they brought the PC home was they connected to the internet. To broad and it was all broadband. You can't even get a telephone connection. So you know, there are a variety of these um, uh, things that government can do and so to think about this in terms of closing the gaps. And so this is a way I think about, so now what are the policies we need to be able to improve ICT and adoption, supply and demand on both sides? And then what are some of the policies for inclusion? Um, clearly, I mean, and, and this is a whole other area, uh, it's radio spectrum. Because in, again, all you have to do is take a look at mobile in emerging countries Right? And the way uh, those, that has been rolled out in, in a way that defied all the conventional wisdom. Nobody could afford it. I'm sorry, people do. Uh, and it's, you know, we now actually have, what, two billion people have mobiles. Um, and, it, and, and going on to three billion, I think. Um, and you know, five years ago, that, was, that would be a laughable prediction. And yet it's already here. Um, that also is why the uh, digital television transition is so important. The digital switch off, um, the, what the people refer to as the digital dividend. Uh, in fact, I was in Ireland yesterday uh, at a, uh, a conference uh, convened by the Irish regulator about the digital dividend. Uh, and the UK is, is one of the leading countries in, um, in Europe on that uh, to make sure that there's more spectrum available at really desirable frequencies for, for wireless broadband to bring broadband to rural parts of uh, uh, all the countries in the you know, UK. Uh, I've already talked about sharing costs of construction rights of way. Um, are you going to enable, rather than block, <laughs> demand, demand creating services like voice over IP and IPTV? I mean, these are, these are, these are government choices. Right? If you really want broadband deployment and adoption, don't do silly things that reduce demand. Um, and then I've already talked about uh, Pricing for low-income users and, and um, uh, lowering cost of adoption, things like PCs. And then uh, getting the balance right between rules and regulation that encourage entry and competition, but also give incumbents the ability to develop as well. Because in most of these countries, uh, the incumbent carrier, while it may be resisting competition, also is where most of the technical expertise in the sector is in the country. And so as a result, you need to get a balance, but it's not gonna happen without competition. So there are a variety of things that you know, government can do, and leadership is actually a really important one. It really matters, right? Just, this, this just can't happen. I mean, the bully pulpit, the, the, the government leaders actually talking about this and putting it on a national agenda and raising it, um, actually makes a difference, and we can talk about that. Um, and then the question is, how do you begin to uh, balance what is the role for government and what is the role for the, uh, the, the private sector? And at the end of the day, it's going to have to be, have to be a, um, a partnership. So uh, questions for research, uh, which is really what I want to engage you all on and get some ideas, um, and then you know, see whether I can sort of encourage you. I, I do jump in on some of this. Um, so what are some of the questions for research? So I've already talked about this, this issue of causality versus correlation. We, there's a lot of data there. We really need deep dive, really good analysis on looking at the relationship between investment in the sector, ICT, productivity, economic gains, and benefits. How does it really affect um, you know, education? Right? The US has spent 
$25 billion, <clears throat> even you know, where the dollar is, that's you know, still probably 13 billion pounds. It's a lot of money over the last uh, 12 years, 13 years on connecting every school, every classroom to the internet. Right? There has not been sufficient evaluative research actually that looks and said, okay, so what impact has that had on curriculum development, on teaching, not just on, and then of course the student performance, but it's again, there's an educational ecosystem. Um, the UK has, has, has had a similar program to connect schools, right? What kind of research, maybe there's been more done here. What about research uh, that looks at uh, people, we talk about uh, healthcare IT, applying all of these new technologies to healthcare and improvement in healthcare, right? Um, have we actually looked at and begun to do the evaluation to see where it works and where it hasn't? What about the lessons that have been learned? Because, right, Bill, a lot of the best research is where actually you find out what didn't work, what failed, and then understanding why. Um, as well as the, the, the core economic questions of the relationship between investment in the sector, use of the technology in the sector, and economic uh, indices, you know, productivity and GDP um, gains. Um, and then there's another one for those who are into sort of the more pure, pure telecom competition uh, uh, world. And that is what we've seen in Europe and the U.S. is that uh, as competition was introduced, right, <clears throat> the incumbents, of course, which were monopolies, lost market share. But their revenue grew because the whole market grew through market stimulation reduction in price and competition as a driver. More services, better products, right? Just think about, you know, uh, what's happened just in, in the UK in terms of, uh, uh, you know, BT. And BT now, uh, you know, uh, their um, traditional business is, has, has shrunk, but their other businesses have grown. Uh, the market has grown. They're beginning to get into IPTV uh, and other things, right? And there's a transition period. Uh, so. Market share declines, revenue grows, whether or not they're more profitable is based upon how well they're managed, right? We know that in, in Europe uh, and the US, right? Has that actually been documented, right? We need some real research and understanding of that because one of the biggest barriers to competition in the emerging countries are the incumbents who don't want change Right? And when you explain to them, yes, your market share, it's very nice being a monopoly, great life, um, but uh, you know, that's really not great for your economy. Uh, and in fact, after a difficult transition, you actually will be better off, right? Which in fact is true, but boy, Richard's laughing because they don't believe it and they're not having any of it, right? But you have to make the case to the minister the president, right, the sheikh. And um, we need research on that as well, real data. And, and some examples in emerging countries, where there, and there are some where that in fact has happened. Markets, Peru for example, uh, when the competition was introduced, the market just exploded um, because the, the incumbent wasn't investing, the incumbent was uh, not offering uh, uh, services that were competitively priced they weren't even offering a lot of the services and the market just grew. And the incumbent actually ended up doing better at the end of the day. So that's another area where we really need good research. So, you know, I, every, day, every day I wake up and I'm, I'm looking at these things and I think, you know, I go back to my, I juggle in my third life, I'm my, my academic, my civil servant, now I'm in the private sector. I go back to my first life and thinking, gee, if, you know, with all my graduate students, what would I have them be working on, right? So, I mean, so these are the, some of the questions that, you know, I'm constantly struggling with that. I think when I say we, I mean this is the whole community and anybody who cares about any of these issues, right? And if, you know, everything that OII cares about needs research that can answer some of these very basic questions in addition to the other things that we're, that we're looking at. So um, I, let's open it up and just have conversation.